Merry Christmas. Great to see you. Our, little, our littlest ones are dismissed for children's Sunday school, and they have a couple of very special guests that are going to visit them today. So ask them after the service, who, whom did they meet? Dr. John White was a British war photographer, a Bible smuggler behind the Iron Curtain, a new tribes missionary to Bolivia, a vineyard church pastor, a well-known author and speaker with InterVarsity, a Canadian psychiatrist and university professor, the husband of a sweet lady named May, and the father of five. John had a patient in Canada named Howard who was hospitalized for severe depression. Antipsychotic and antidepressant drugs and electroconvulsive treatments did not help Howard. One day in a counseling session, Howard admitted feeling guilt for many years over things from drinking to not enlisting in World War II when many of his friends got killed as soldiers. Howard was Russian Orthodox. But even confession to his priest brought no assurance of God's forgiveness. So as an evangelist and not as a psychiatrist, John asked Howard, how could God forgive you? Howard answered, because Christ died and shed his blood, but I'm too bad to be forgiven. So John asked, what do you mean you're too bad? Howard replied, I don't deserve to be forgiven. At that moment, John felt righteous anger well up inside. So he said, of course you don't deserve to be forgiven. No one deserves it. Who do you think you are to say that Christ's death was not enough? God says Christ's death is enough to forgive all your sins forever. If you don't believe that, then you're calling God a liar. But if you accept God's wonderful gift of salvation in Christ, you're forgiven and forever free from the guilt that you have suffered all your life. At that moment, the truth sunk into Howard's soul by faith. Howard began to cry and pray a real prayer for the first time in his life. Thanks, God. I'm so sorry. I didn't know. How come nobody ever told me this before? I've been blind all my life, but now I see. Howard didn't know that he was quoting the words of a Christian song. In a short time, nurses began to post comments on Howard's hospital and medical chart. Remarkable improvement, no longer depressed, paranoid ideation not expressed, making realistic plans for the future. God had transformed Howard's life by faith in the simple good news of Jesus Christ and by trusting in the Lamb of God who was slaughtered to redeem us by His blood. That same good news has transformed the lives of millions of people over the centuries, each having his or her own personal testimony like Howard had. And that same good news of the Redeemer Lamb is shouted and sung by billions of angels in heaven. And today we read the lyrics of their chants and songs in the last half of Revelation chapter 5, which we began studying last week. But unlike last week, when I ask you to read the entire chapter 5 of Revelation, I don't want you to read the whole chapter this week. I only want you to read aloud the words of the angels and the heavenly host, and I'll read the rest of the chapter. So I will cue you with the bold-faced letters when you can join me. So in honor of God's word, would you please stand, and I'll begin reading in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, and then you will join me when the letters get bold-faced. So let's begin Revelation 5, 1. John writes, then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne, God the Father, a scroll with writing on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look in it. 
And I cried and cried because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look in it. Then one of the elders said to me, stop crying. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has been victorious so that he may open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. He came and took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. When he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and gold bowls filled with incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, join me, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slaughtered and you redeemed people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I'll continue, verse 11. Then I looked, said John, and heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and also the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. They said with a loud voice, join me, the lamb who was slaughtered is worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Then John says, verse 13, I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, join me, blessing and honor and glory and dominion to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. The four living creatures said together, amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. Let's talk to this one who's seated on the throne and to his son. Dear Father, I thank you for your marvelous word that reveals what heaven is like. And I pray today that your spirit would open our minds, our hearts to this truth, and that we would learn to love and adore and honor and praise and worship our Lord Jesus Christ as he truly deserves. Now, at Christmas time, throughout our lives and forever. And I ask this in His amazing name. Amen. You may be seated. Before we finish the last part of Revelation chapter 5, I thought I would review our study so far in the book of Revelation and give you a preview of where we're going. And here's a new chart, and you know I love charts. So let's look at the whole thing now. I'm not going to ask you to see this, but I want you to see this V shape here, and then we'll bring it into a little bit better focus. Let's go to the next one. Back in Revelation chapter 1, John had this glorified, this vision of the glorified risen Lord Jesus. He was on earth, the island of Patmos. Then in chapters 2 and 3, we spent seven weeks, basically two months, studying Jesus' seven letters to these churches where he is Christ, the Lord of those churches and of all believers. Again, the scene on earth, Asia Minor there. These two chapters are a hinge that looks back at this vision in chapter 1 and that looks forward to the last two chapters of the book with the new heaven and the new earth. Then this basically, I remember I told you it was a hinge, but what I didn't tell you is that this is basically a fulcrum on which the book of Revelation pivots. And every fulcrum has two sides to the hinge. So let's now go to the other side. So beginning at the bottom going up, this hinge of chapters 4 and 5 that we've spent these three weeks studying, Christ the Lion and Redeemer Lamb. He's redeemed those from every tribe, nation, people, language. The scene is heaven. And this sets in motion the rest of Revelation where Jesus takes the scroll and then beginning in chapter 6, he begins to break those seals. So those chapters 6 to 18, Christ is the mediator of God's judgment. The scene is earth during the tribulation, but it switches back and forth between heaven and earth. Then chapters 19 and 20, the climax of the book, Christ the conquering king and judge, 
on earth at the end of the tribulation and into the thousand year reign. And then finally 21, I left off 22, I'm sorry. Christ, the eternal bridegroom, and the revelation of the new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. So again, let's go back to the next, look at the whole thing again. So again, chapters 2 to 3, 4 and 5, pivot the entire book back forward, and then setting in motion the rest of the book. So uh, we'll unpack that more when it comes in the new year. Now I want to show you one more chart. There are 14 doxologies, 14 praise choruses and anthems in Revelation. But here in chapters 4 and 5, there are five of them. And so you can see the references. The, two weeks ago, we studied chapter 4, and both of those focus of those choruses by the four living creatures and 24 elders focus on God the Father. Then last week we looked, uh, and today, at the four living creatures and 24 elders, first focusing on God the Son, Christ the Lamb. This is the middle doxology, the most important one. And then it builds from there with millions of angels focused on Christ the Lamb, God the Son, and then finally every creature. And here, notice it's God the Father and God the Son, Christ the Lamb. So there is a progression, and we'll talk about that in just a second. This progression here is like the blooming of a rose. And I don't know how many of you love roses, but it's one of the most wonderful flowers that God ever created. So well, think with me as we look at the chart again from the rosebud on through the full rose. Beginning God the Father's worship in the first two doxologies, that's the bud beginning to open. Middle doxology, we will focus on in just a moment. God the Son, Christ the Lamb is worshiped. And then we go to the fourth one and the fifth one where the entire rose opens and in, comes into full bloom. These five doxologies sung and chanted in heaven, teach us that Jesus Christ is worshipped equally with God the Father. That confirms for us that He is God, equal to His Father. Look at verse 8 again. When He took the scroll, that is the Lamb, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the Lamb in worship. We see that in the last verse of chapter 5. They would not worship anyone who was not God. And so this proves who Jesus really is. Now, a little trivia question. The harp or lyre, L-Y-R-E, the other name for this instrument, is one of two musical instruments mentioned in the book of Revelation. Can anybody remember what the other musical instrument in Revelation is? Very good. Trumpet. Okay. So you get... Something. We'll have to figure out what it is afterwards. I know. <laughs> so heaven has uh, brass instrument and trumpets, and they have stringed instruments with the harp or the lyre. We are not told in Revelation that there are wind or percussion instruments, and I would guess that there's probably instruments that we have no equivalent of here on the earth. But we're going to see later in the book of Revelation that perhaps God uses natural phenomena, the actual winds upon the earth as wind instruments, and the lightning and the thunder as perhaps percussion instruments. So we'll look at that idea a little bit later. The gold bowls filled with incense, which John defines as the prayers of the saints. Now, since all of us Christians are saints, then which of our prayers are being referred to here? If you take the immediate context of Revelation 5, the very next chapter has martyrs during the tribulation period praying for vindication in heaven. Let's look at that. Revelation 6, verse 9. When the Lamb opened the fifth seal, I saw under the, water, under the altar the people slaughtered because of God's word and the testimony they had. They cried out with a loud voice in prayer, Lord, the one who is holy and true, how long until you judge and avenge our blood from those who live on the earth? In the new year, we'll look at that, but it's very interesting, a very different kind of prayer than what you might expect in heaven. So the gold bowls may simply be these prayers of the saints that came out of the tribulation who gave their lives for Christ. But if these bowls contain the prayers of all saints, all believers who have ever lived, then that's a very different concept. Every time you or I pray, our prayers 
are treasured in heaven like sweet-smelling incense. Have you ever thought of your prayers like that? That your prayers are that important and precious to God? What an incentive for us to pray. At the beginning in my opening illustration, we heard Howard, the man who talked baby talk as a new Christian, uh, so fresh and, and um, real to God. But then we're going to see later in my message a couple of very mature Christians and how they pray as well. So fellow saints, let's pray. Our prayers have much greater value to God than we can ever imagine. And of course, that's not even talking about the results of our prayers when God answers. Just the value of those prayers themselves, an amazing concept. Verse 9, and they sang a new song. Again, notice this is the 24 elders and the four living creatures. You are worthy, speaking to the Lamb, to take the scroll and open its seals, because you were slaughtered and you redeemed people for God by your blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. This first great doxology in chapter 5 praises Jesus Christ the Lamb, not just because He's God, but also because He is the Redeemer who was slaughtered as a sacrifice for our sins on the cross. One of the many things that we can learn from worship in heaven is that one of its central themes is redemption, the redemption of Christ through His cross. And I pray that our church always imitates that heavenly worship by singing and praising Jesus as our God, our Savior, and our Redeemer. And who is the target, the focus of that redemption? Those from every tribe and language and people and nation. In a later message, I will unpack those four groups and we will think about how incredibly significant that worldwide salvation is. But we will look at that in a future message. But not only has Jesus forgiven us and redeemed us, He has also made us believers a kingdom, that is, kings and priests who will someday reign with Him on earth. Now, many of our amillennial brothers believe that we Christians will only rule spiritually in heaven. But what does this verse say? According to this verse, heaven's hosts believe otherwise. We will, as believers, literally reign on this earth with Christ someday in a physical kingdom. And who are we to contradict those in heaven who know better than we do. These celestial cantatas in Revelation 5 have inspired many earthly compositions over the centuries. And I want to give you two examples. So we go from Howard, who was a brand new baby Christian, to two very mature believers now. Johann Sebastian Bach was one of the three greatest composers who ever lived, along with Beethoven and Mozart. Very famous neo-Orthodox theologian Karl Barth, who was German, and only a German would understand this completely because Bach was German. But uh, Bach said this about both Mozart and about Bach. He said, when God's around, the angels listen to Bach. But when God's not around, the angels listen to Mozart. So, of course, you have to be a German to really appreciate that. But unlike Beethoven and Mozart, Bach was a devout Christian whom we will meet someday in heaven. And he was also a great theologian, as I will demonstrate to you from his great oratorio, St. John's Passion. Now, this is actually the first page uh, of that uh, St. John's Passion. And, of course, the very black, black notes all through it, of course, is very Bachian, if we could say that. He wrote another great oratorio on St. Matthew's Passion, but I want you, and by the way, this was composed in 1724, 52 years before the American Revolution, to give you some historical context. But I want you to listen to some, the very personal prayer that's in the middle of this cantata, this oratorio, written by Bach. And let's look at it. Who has struck you thus, my Savior, and with torments so evilly used you? You are not at all a sinner like us and our children. You know nothing of transgressions. 
I, I and my sins, that can be found like the grains of sand by the sea. These have brought you the misery that assails you. Speaking of on the cross. Ah, great king, great for all times. How can I sufficiently proclaim this love? No human heart, however, can conceive of a fit offering to you. I cannot grasp with my mind how to imitate your mercy. How can I then repay your deeds of love with my actions? In the bottom of my heart, your name and cross alone sparkles at all times and hours for which I can be joyful. Shine forth for me in that image as comfort in my need. How you, Lord Christ, so gently bled to death. This was written by a man who knew the Lord and knew that sacrifice that Jesus paid for us that makes it possible for us to go to this place called heaven. But long before Bach, another brilliant theologian imitated these heavenly choruses in Revelation 5. St. Anselm was one of the three greatest theologians who ever lived, along with Augustine and Aquinas, or Augustine if you want Anselm personally knew William the Conqueror and lived during the Norman conquest of England and the Battle of Hastings, 1066. Anselm is famous for his ontological argument for the existence of God and for his satisfaction theory of the atonement. Let me tell you about that briefly. Anselm taught from Scripture that all men owe God righteousness, but because we're sinners, we can never satisfy God, a key word. But what we cannot do Christ has done for us. Because Christ is perfect, He satisfies God's righteous demands that we cannot. Now, if this sounds very theological to you, let's look at a personal prayer written by Anselm, and this is a copy of that in Latin, but we'll look at it in an English translation. And as we look at this prayer that Anselm wrote, I want you to see how in words, his words soar like Bach's music. Let's look at it. Lord Jesus Christ, the good shepherd who condescended to die for your flock. The sins you bore were my sins. I, an obstinate slave, committed crimes for which you were flogged. It was my debts that were paid by you. My iniquity was the cause of your death. And my misdeeds brought about your wounds. Alas, for my sins, for which atonement had to be made by so bitter a death. And then look at this middle paragraph in yellow. Oh, unspeakable mercy, that when satisfaction for guilt was owed by none but man, and none but God was able to provide it, God showed His mercy by becoming man, And though he owed nothing for himself, paid our debt by dying for us. Brothers and sisters, the goal of a theologian isn't to make things muddy. It's to make things clear. And I think this is one of the clearest statements of the gospel that has ever been written by any person. And yet it's a prayer. Let's finish it. Oh, holy Jesus, what shall I render for you? What shall I endure for you who endured so often and so much for me? The display of what you have done is the proof of your love. What am I to do who am the unworthy recipient of this love? How can I return this love? What amazing questions. And the answer to these final questions that Anselm asks in his prayer are answered in verse 11 of Revelation 5 by these angels. Let's look at that again. John says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also the living creatures and the elders. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. The highest conceivable number in Greek is expressed here. You could go no higher than a thousand. So to express anything higher in Greek, you had to do multiples of a thousand. So a thousand squared is a billion. A thousand to the power of three Oh, sorry, a thousand to the power of two, or or squared is a million, a thousand to the power of three is a billion, and it keeps going on from there, where no one is sure just how much, a trillion, a quadrillion, a quintillion, how many angels. The point is, it's 
innumerable. They said with a loud voice, and here is what they said, the lamb who was slaughtered is worthy. We were unworthy, but he is worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. As we listen in on this innumerable company of angels praising the Lamb, we ask, how can we creatures give God anything? He already owns everything. And the answer is, that is the point of worshiping God. Not just with our words, but with our whole being. All of it is already His. In a real sense, we never give God anything. It already belongs to Him. But Let's personalize those seven great things that are offered to Christ in a personal way. The lamb who was slain is worthy to receive from me, Frank Carmichael, or from you, power, his authority and rule over my life, family, church and world, riches, all my silver and all my gold, not a penny will I withhold, plus my time and talents, wisdom, my finest intellectual achievements, life experiences and skills, strength, all my physical abilities and prowess dedicated only for His service, strength, honor, a single pure desire to magnify Him in all I do, say, and think, glory, my entire life devoted as a holy thank you offering to Him. And finally, blessing. All His blessings He's given me, I simply give back to Him in praise and worship. Brothers and sisters, our lives are on loan. John simply writes in the book of Revelation what he saw and heard. But that does not mean that his writing is simple. These three doxologies of praise in Revelation chapter 5 are arranged like a crescendo in music or a literary Roman candle. Now, you know what a Roman candle is. You've seen them on the 4th of July and other fireworks shows. A Roman candle shoots into the sky, explodes in spectacular pyrotechnics, and trails off like shooting stars. Then just as the first round is dying out, we earthbound watchers are awed by a second explosion that blazes into glory in a different color. But before we get over the thrill of that second brilliant blast... Just as it's dying out, we gasp in giddy, childlike glee as a third dazzling display in a third color lights up the sky for a final kaboom. Revelation chapter 5, verses 8 to 14 is a magnificent heavenly Roman candle. First, the 28 beings who are closest to the throne, four living creatures, 24 elders, speaking of the past, Praise Him for four things. Then in verses 11 to 12, countless angelic hosts, speaking of the present, praise Him for the seven things we have just looked at. And then finally, every creature in the universe, speaking of the future forever and ever, praises Him for four things. So you have this little chiasm again, the X pattern. Looking ahead to our study in the new year, we will have some tough sledding to do in this middle section of the book of Revelation, starting in chapter 6. But the triple set of judgments known as seals, trumpets, and bowls are also like a literary Roman candle. The lamb breaks the six seals. He waits, breaks the seventh, which contains the seven trumpets. The trumpet is sounded, the seventh, which unleashes the seven bowl judgments. So this is the triple Roman candle that we will be looking at as human wrath, satanic wrath, and God's wrath are unleashed up on the earth during those terrible years to come. But that's part of our study in 2017, so come back, please. So this glorious chapter of praise and worship concludes by pulling out all the stops. Verse 13, John says, I heard every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, blessing and honor and glory and dominion or kingdom to the one seated on the throne, the God the Father, and to the Lamb, God the Son, forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Every creature, maybe every human and angel, including demons, but it may also include animals. So in this third doxology, bees buzz, elephants trumpet, 
Lions roar and seals bark and clap. And in this final scene of worship in verse 13, it may anticipate the day, because a lot of this is very timeless. What the heaven's tracking of time is different from ours. That future day that we look at in Philippians chapter 2, and I think it's important for us to read it. Verse 5, make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself not of deity, but he emptied himself by adding to himself, by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven... Sound familiar? And on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. A day will come when even unbelievers will grudgingly bow and confess then what they will not believe or submit to here and now, but then it will be too late. Please do not be part of that group then. Now is the time to start our worship our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Three comments and we're done. For three weeks now, we have been studying in Revelation 4 and 5 about heaven. Two chapters teach us that heaven is not a legend. It's not a myth. It's not a wish. Heaven is really there, not a product of deceived, deluded, or demented religious fanatics. Heaven is a place, a location so real that if you had its address, you could find heaven's coordinates on GPS, God's positioning system. Our study in these two chapters, Revelation 4 and 5, teaches us above everything else that heaven is satisfied with what Jesus did on the cross. All of Scripture teaches that God the Father is satisfied with what Jesus did on the cross. And the most important question in life is, are you satisfied? with what Jesus did on the cross for you because that determines whether or not you will spend eternity with him. It's first in heaven, then new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem. Are you trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Redeemer Lamb who bore your sins on the cross? I pray you have made that decision. If not, what a wonderful time to make it during the Christmas holidays. I have several friends who trusted in Jesus on Christmas Day or during Christmas. It's one of the greatest times of year to put your faith in Christ if you have not. Finally, because we're near Christmas, I thought it would be appropriate to end today by looking at what we call the Christmas story, because when those angels spoke and sang their Christmas chorus to the shepherds on earth 2,000 years ago, what we have just read in Revelation 5 is the backstory. It is the counterpoint to what the angels said to the shepherds at Christmas. So since I didn't ask you to read much at the beginning, now I'm going to put you to work. I want to ask you to stand, and I want you to read aloud with me the Christmas story from Luke 2. And because it's so familiar, we will look at this in the New King James Version. So beginning in Luke chapter... 2 verse 1, together please. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. So all went to be registered, every one to his own town. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Verse 8. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. 
And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, All together, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Verse 15. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Would you bow your heads in prayer? Father, not just at Christmas, but all year long, I pray that my heart and the hearts of all of us here would learn to worship you And your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Redeemer Lamb, and give Him all that we have because it already belongs to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.